Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering, IIT Guwahati. So the ion exchange chromatography is being used very extensively to purify the positively charged or the negatively charged proteins and you can have the flexibility of using the cation exchange chromatography or the anion exchange chromatography. So apart from the protein purification, the ion exchange chromatography is also being used very extensively in other kind of application. Let us see in what way the ion exchange chromatography can be exploited to uh, answer few basic questions related to science as well as how it can be used in the daily life as well. So the first application what we are going to discuss is about the utilization of ion exchange chromatography in developing different types of assays or studying the interaction between the two biomolecules. We have taken an example of the interaction of DNA and RNA, DNA and protein. But this could be replicated with a little optimization for any two biomolecules in which the criteria is that one of the biomolecules should have the affinity for a particular type of uh, uh, ion exchange ion exchange matrix whether it would be for cation exchange chromatography or the anion exchange chromatography and the other biomolecule should not have the direct affinity for the particular matrix. So, if you have this particular type of criteria, you could be able to uh, study the interaction between the these two biomolecules. So, let us take an example how you can study the interaction between a DNA and protein. So, in this kind of applications, you know that the DNA is negatively charged. So, for a negatively charged DNA, you are going to use the anion exchange chromatography which means you are going to use the anion matrix and anion matrix are going to be positively charged. So, they will very readily bind the DNA. So, in the first step what you are going to do is you are going to load the DNA which you are interested to uh, study the interaction between a protein X. So, in the first step you load the DNA and what will happen is that the DNA will go and bind to these anion matrix or anion beads. Now the second step and then you, you, you wash the uh, beads so that whatever the DNA is binding to the matrix uh, or, uh, or, or whatever the DNA is uh, non-specifically binding to the uh, matrix beads should be removed. And then what you do is you follow the protein onto this column. So, if this protein is going to have the interaction with the DNA, it is going to bind the DNA instead of matrix because this protein should not have the affinity for anion matrix at this pH. So, you can actually optimize the pH in such a way so that the protein is going to have the uh, will not going to bind the anion matrix. And now, you can elute this whole complex with the help of a salt. When you do so, the DNA and protein complexes will be removed. Now, once you analyze these, so protein can be analyzed on the SDS page, whereas the DNA can be analyzed on the agarose. So, once you elute the, uh, the complexes from the, these beads, you are going to get the different fractions and all these different fractions can be uh, can be analyzed on the SDS page as well as on the agarose gel. So, the protein is going to be analyzed on the SDS page whereas the DNA is going to be analyzed on the agarose gel. When you analyze them, you will find that there is a discrete pattern in which if you see here, what you see is that low concentration of uh, protein and then it, the protein is uh, making a peak and then it is going down which means if you plot this 
what you will see is the protein is actually following this pattern. Whereas, if you follow the DNA on the agarose gel, what you will see is that the DNA is also following the similar kind of pattern. To understand or to clarify whether this interaction or this pattern you are getting simply because the protein X is interacting with the DNA, uh, you have to run a control reaction where you can load the protein X into the column an ion column and in that case the protein should not bind and protein should present in the flow through. So that is a control reaction you have to do to ensure that the protein which is binding to the column is not directly binding to the column but it is binding to the DNA which is bound to the beads. So that is what is written in this approach the anion exchange matrix is incubated with the DNA and allow it to bind tightly. Now the pure protein is passed through the DNA bound beads followed by a washing with the buffer to remove unbound proteins. Now the DNA is eluted from the matrix either by adding high salt concentration or by making a denaturating conditions for that you can add the urea or GDMCL or something. So that actually is going to remove the complexes. Now you can uh, get the fractions and these fractions can be tested for the presence of DNA on the agarose gel and the protein on the SDS whale. And the eluted protein is analyzed in the SDS page and the DNA is in the agarose gel and that is what we have said. What you are supposed to do when you do this experiment, it will say okay protein X is interacting with the DNA but to verify these things you can actually uh, do like uh, control experiments such as that you can add the protein and its mutants and some something like that or you will perform the similar experiments and a different pH because you know that the DNA and proteins are making an interaction through the electrostatic interaction. So if you change the pHs the pattern may vary and uh, so that is how you actually can study the DNA and protein interaction and but as I said this approach can be used for any two biomolecules. The condition is that the biomolecule 1 should have the affinity for the ion exchange chromatography whether it is cation exchange chromatography or the anion exchange chromatography and the biomolecule number 2 should not have the direct affinity for the matrix. So that if you find the biomolecule 2 into the purification that will be only be possible if it is interacting with the your biomolecule number 1. So this is all about the studying the interaction between the two biomolecules. In this case we have taken an example of DNA and protein. Now you can also use the ion exchange chromatography to study the protein kinase assay. You know the protein kinase assay. So if you use the uh, protein X and if you add the ATP the protein kinase what protein kinase will do is it is going to take up the phosphate from the ATP and that phosphate will be transferred onto the substrate and you will get the X phosphate and the ATP is getting converted into the ADP. So in this kinase assays what you have to do is uh, a radioactive substrate uh, was incubated with the enzyme protein kinase MgCl2 and a non radioactive ATP. A negative control is also being incubated where the enzyme protein kinase is absent from the assay mixture. Okay? So that will give you the background uh, counts. Reaction mixture from the negative control and the experimental will be loaded onto two separate cation exchange chromatography columns to bind the unphosphorylated substrate from the reaction mixture whereas the phosphorylated radio radioactive substrate is present in the flow through. The radioactive count of the flow through was measured using a liquid scintillation reagent. So this is just an example where you are actually uh, allowing the modified substrate to be flow through from the uh, column and you can measure that the modified substrate and that is how you can actually co correlate that with the activity of that particular protein kinase. But this is not true only for the protein kinase, the any X reactions where you will see a change in charge could be used. For example, if you are would like to study the acetylation, acetylation is going to bring the negative charge. So acetylation is nothing but the addition of carboxyl group onto the protein molecules or sometime you can also use this kind of uh, uh, ion exchange chromatography also to study the uh, other kind of modif protein modification as well. The condition is that this modification should give you a modified 
charge onto the substrate. For example, in this case, the, the substrate which is radio labeled, when it gets modified by the protein kinase activity, it is getting the negatively charged. So, that negatively charged molecule will not going to bind the cation exchange chromatography, whereas this molecule is going to bind the cation exchange chromatography and that is how you could be able to separate the modified substrate from the unmodified substrate. Now, this is the daily, daily use application of ion exchange chromatography where the ion exchange chromatography can be used for the softening of water. So, you know that the water what we are getting from the ground water has several metals as a contamination such as calcium, magnesium and other cationing metals. A cation exchange chromatography matrix with bound sodium is packed in a column and the hard water containing calcium, magnesium is passed through the column. So, uh, the, these cartridges you might have seen in your home as well when you buy a aqua guard or some kind of put water purification system, what you will see is that it has two chambers. In one of the chambers, it actually contains these kind of beads and what these beads are, these beads are cation exchange uh, beads and these cation exchange beads are uh, masked by the sodium. So, the sodium is actually bind to the cation exchange uh, beads and when you follow the uh, hard water which actually contains calcium and magnesium and arsenic and all other kind of um, heavy metals. So, all these heavy metals are actually having the uh, positive charges and they actually are going to replace the sodium which is bound to the beads and the, the, the sodium is going to be removed from the column on a daily basis. So, if you want uh, as so as long as you are purifying the water, the, the, the bound metals are binding to the column and the sodium which is coming out from the these cartridges are getting mixed to the water. But this is going to be exhausted very uh, after some time because the amount of sodium which is bound is limited. So, after that you have to do a regeneration steps. So, once this is done, so in this process what happen is that the calcium present in the solution, calcium or magnesium or all other heavy metals present in the solution preferentially migrates from the solution to the matrix whereas, sodium ion present on the matrix migrates to the solution. So, there would be uh, ionic exchange take place in which the sodium from the beads moves towards the solution and the magnesium or calcium or other heavy metal moves towards the beads. The matrix can be used for softening of the water and unit until it has bound sodium ions. Once the sodium ions are exhausted, matrix can be regenerated by flowing a solution of sodium chloride or sodium hydroxide. So, once the beads are getting, uh, getting uh, is going to lose all the sodium, they are not going to bind any more uh, these metals. So, in those cases, what you do is you, you follow a uh, solution of sodium either the NaCl or the NaOH and that actually is going to remove the, uh, the, the bead bounds calcium as well as the magnesium and other metals and these heavy metals can be collected in a waste and that waste can be disposed into a sewage. So, uh, the calcium or magnesium bounds to the matrix comes out in the solution and can be dumped into the sewage. So, that is how you actually remove the heavy metals or the other kind of contaminating metals from the water and uh, once the column is getting choked or once the column is getting saturated and it does not have any more sodium for available for making an exchange, then what you do is you flow a very high concentration of sodium and that actually is going to regenerate these cartridges and the, uh, the bead bounds calcium and magnesium will come out from the cartridge and that can be stored and dumped into a sewage. So, this is the very briefly we will discuss about the application of ion exchange chromatography in protein purification as well as in terms of uh, uh, other applications so that you can use the ion exchange chromatography for developing the different types of assays or you can use them for studying the interaction between the biomolecule or we have taken one example of daily use where you can use the ion exchange chromatography to uh, prepare or uh, to purify the water and make the water uh, hard water into the uh, uh, clean water and you can remove the contaminating metals because all these metals are toxic for the human being 
and so the, this is all about the ion exchange chromatography and its application in the biotechnology related processes. Now let us move on to the next chromatography. So, we are already done with the ion exchange chromatography in terms of uh, the mechanism, in terms of principle, how to operate the ion exchange chromatography and as well as its application and let us move on to the another technique which is called as the hydrophobic interaction chromatography. So, as the name suggests the hydrophobic interaction chromatography is going to exploit or going to utilize the hydrophobic groups which are present on the protein. So, the hydrophobic interaction chromatography exploits the ability of a strong interaction between hydrophobic groups attached to the matrix and the hydrophobic patches present on the analyte such as the protein. So, as we discussed in the past, the protein is made up of, of amino acids and these amino acids are of diversified nature, they could be positively charged uh, amino acids, negatively charged amino acids, um, non-polar amino acids, polar amino acids and the hydrophobic amino acids. But the hydrophobic amino acids, there is a ten, uh, does not like the water because they would like to shield from the water. So, while the protein is being synthesized as a chain of amino acid, it starts folding and the folding is always been guided by the sequence of amino acids. So, you can see that as the synthesis of a protein starts and you can see this dark region what you see is actually the region which is containing the uh, hydrophobic amino acids such as tryptophan and phenylalanine and tyrosine. And, uh, so, this, uh, so now the protein has started folding and now this is a, your hydrophobic group and what you see is the protein is folding in such a way so that this hydrophobic groups should be present inside whereas it will be covered by the hydrophilic as well as the polar groups so that these polar groups could be able to interact with the water molecules which are present in the buffer or other micro environments. And what will happen is that eventually all the hydrophobic groups would be present in the center of the protein whereas all the hydrophilic, hydrophilic uh, polar groups would be present outside. So, if you see a, a cross section of a protein, what you will see is that this is going to be the hydrophobic core which is present in the protein molecules and you are going to have the hydrophilic uh, outside. Apart from that, the protein molecules are also having the uh, different types of the hydrophobic patches and these patches are also being covered by the pro uh, presence of water outside. This water is actually a part of the hydration shell. So, every protein which actually is present in the biological fluid is being covered by the small uh, tiny water molecules and these tiny water molecules are been covering the protein so that the protein should have should be always been present in a in a uh, in an aqueous environment and that actually protects these proteins and conserves its biological activity so these water molecule which are present outside are called as the hydration shell and the amount of hydration shell which is present outside the protein varies from one protein to another protein and it depends on the number of pol polar molecules, the charge molecules, the negatively charged, the positively charged the amino acids which are present on the cell surface, on the surface of the protein. And this hydration shell is very important in terms of protein uh, maintaining the three dimensional structure of the protein as well as in terms of maintaining the enzymatic activity of these proteins. So, so the, you have the hydrophobic patches, but these hydrophobic patches are also being covered by the hydration shell. So, uh, if you have to perform the hydrophobic interaction chromatography, the first question comes how you are going to access the hydrophobic molecules or hydrophobic patches to uh, so that the hydrophobic groups which are present on these beads are having a accessibility to these groups so that they will be able to bind. So, for that 
if you have to uh, achieve this task what is the first thing is that you have to remove the hydration shell in such a way or in a milder way so that you will be able to have the access to the hydrophobic patches. Now let us see how you can do that. So you can imagine that the uh, uh, you have a protein and the pro outside the protein you have the hydration shell. So this hydration shell which actually I said no, hydration shell contains the water molecules. So you know that the water molecule is going to have more solubility for salt compared to that it is going to having the association with the protein. So if you want to remove this hydration shell which is present outside the protein, you can add the small amount of salt. So when you add a very small amount of salt to the protein solution that actually is going to make the displacement of bonded water molecule which is a part of the hydration shell and that actually is going to increase the solubility. Why it is going to increase the solubility because it is going to increase the number of protein molecule which can additionally be used and which can additionally be solubilized because you are removing the you are removing the water and uh, that is actually making more space uh, available for more number of water mo protein molecule to be get solubilized. So that actually is going to increase the protein solubility and this effect of increasing the solubility by adding the amount salt is called as the salting in. But if you increase the salt like if you increase more amount of the salt the water molecules shielding the protein side chain are also displaced completely with the help of an exposure of the hydrophobic patches okay, on the protein surface to induce the protein precipitation or decrease in solubility. So it, this uh, solubility of the protein is going to be uh, increased until you are not removing the hydration shell which are protecting the hydrophobic patches. Once you remove or uh, remove the water and uh, expose these hydrophobic patches, then the hydrophobic patches present on one protein is going to make the interaction with the neighboring protein and that is how either it, it will induce the precipitation or it will induce the aggregation of these proteins and this effect of Remo reducing the solubility is called as the salting out which means this is going to remove the protein from the solution. This is actually been always uh, uh, done in a very very traditional uh, chromatogra uh, traditional uh, protein purification approaches where people actually use these salts and they use the salting out methods to precipitate the protein in a differential manner. For example, if you have a complex protein mixture, you can actually use the salting out as an approach to purify the different protein by because every protein is going to have the different amino acid composition and accordingly it is going to have the different amount of the hydration shell present outside. So uh, if you vary the salting out, you could be able to separate them and you can precipitate some protein but the other protein will still be remain in the solution because their hydration shell is still intact and if you add some more salt those protein also get precipitated. So if you do in a stepwise manner uh, you could be able to separate the different proteins and that is actually is always been done in a traditional biochemistry way where you actually precipitate the protein by uh, adding the different amount of salts. Uh, so the phenomena of salting out is modulated in such a way so that you add the salt that will induce the exposure of hydrophobic patches on the surface but does not cause the precipitation or aggregation. So you have to make a very fine control and you have to optimize in such a way that you remove the hydration shells but at the same time you do not allow the protein protein molecules to uh, stick to each other to form the aggregates or the precipitate and that is how you could be able to expose the hydrophobic patches present on the protein molecules. The exposure of hydrophobic patches facilitate the binding of the protein to the non-polar ligands attached to the matrix 
when the concentration of salt is decreased the exposed hydrophobic patches on the protein reduces the affinity towards and as a result it get eluted so once you increase the salt uh, it the hydrophobic patches are going to be exposed and that actually will facilitate the binding of the protein to the uh, uh, matrix and uh, once the you are uh, once you do the washing and then after washing you can actually reduce the salt once you reduce the salt actually you will bring the hydration shell back and that actually going to protect the uh, patches and again the interaction between the hydrophobic patch and the ligand which is present on the matrix is going to be broken down and that's how your protein will going to be eluted from the beads so the choice of uh, uh, hic the choice of hic matrix i have given a few examples like butyl sulfurose phenyl sulfurose phenyl sulfurose high substituted and low substituted Do, then you we have the capto phenyl sulfurose and octyl sulfurose you can have the many more molecules so you have the actually the flexibility of either having the aliphatic groups or to the aromatic groups uh, attached to the uh, beads and accordingly these molecules are going to have the differential affinity uh, in some cases you can have the benzene based aromatic uh, ligands and uh, what you see is the that we have the two variants low substituted and high substituted which means this is going to have the low amount of ligands attached to the beads whereas this is going to have the high amount of phenyl sulfurose phenyl groups attached to the sulfurose beads that's why these this column the uh, phenyl sulfurose low substituted is going to have the lower affinity for a uh, hydrophobic interactions whereas this is going to have the higher affinity so uh, you can choose the suitable matrix uh, which is essential to achieve the best results the strength of the binding of analyte on a is is governed by the two factor one what ligand you are using for interactions and the chain length what you are using because if you increase the chain length you are actually giving the more flexibility for the ligand to interact with the hydrophobic groups of the inner core hydrophobic groups present on the proteins so the chain length the the suppose this is a beads and so this is your uh, hic matrix so the length of this linker which you are going to use to attach the uh, group is very very important and the group if this group could be aliphatic groups or these groups could be the aromatic groups and depending on whether you use the aliphatic groups or the aromatic groups the, in, the affinity of these uh, these ligands would be different because the uh, Uh, the matrix with the aromatic rings containing ligands makes additional pi pi interaction and they will bind analytes more strongly than the same number of carbon containing aliphatic ligands see in addition the presence of pi pi interaction gives selectivity as well such as uh, ring containing aromatic ligands phenylalanine at last the ligands and density play a pivotal role in the strength of binding of analyte to the matrix hence these points should be considered to choose a suitable matrix for purification in one of the major issue with the hydrophobic interaction chromatography is that you have to optimally see that you should have an interaction but it should not be so strong that while you reduce the salt and you should not get the protein being eluted from the column because if this interaction is going to be so strong that the protein got stuck to the bat beads and it should not get getting uh, removed then in those cases uh, uh, the protein is going to be denatured or it will not be going there will be no recovery of this protein from the beads and then in uh, you will not going to have the no option you have no option but to discard these beads uh so this is what uh, you have a hic matrix you add your protein which is already been incubated with the high salt so once you high you put the under the high salt the protein will bind to the hic matrix and then you do a washing step and then you are going to reduce the salt concentration as soon as you reduce the salt concentration the protein is going to be eluted and that actually is going to leave your hic uh, matrix 
and that can be used for next round of uh, chromatography. So, it, the operation of HIC has multiple steps. In the first step, you are going to do an equilibration. The HIC column matrix packed in a column and equilibrate with a buffer containing 0.5 to 1.5 molar ammonium sulphate. You can use any salt, but the people are always preferring to use the ammonium sulphate because the ionic strength of the ammonium sulphate is very high compared to the NaCl or the KCl which people use for other applications. So, if you use the NaCl or KCl, you might have to add the more concentration of these salts compared to the amino, uh, amino, amino sulphate. As a mobile phase, the salt must be below the concentration where it has the salting out effect, which means it should not precipitate or aggregate the protein. So, you have to use the high concentration of ammonium sulphate, but it should not be so high that it is going to precipitate the protein because otherwise the protein is going to be precipitated and it will not be available for making an interaction with the ligands which are present on the beads. Now, in the second step, you are going to prepare the samples. The sample is prepared in the mobile phase and it should be free of suspended particle to avoid the clogging of the column. The most recommended method to apply the sample is to inject the sample with a syringe. Now the third step, you have to do the elution. There are many ways to elute a analyte from the hydrophobic interaction chromatography. Number one, decreasing the salt concentration. So you can actually decrease the salt concentration and that actually will bring the hydration shell back and that actually is going to destroy the interaction between the ligand as well as the uh, hydrophobic patches present on the protein. Then you can change the polarity of the mobile phase such as you can have the alcohol. So, you can also have the competitive molecules because the alcohol is going to be more hydrophobic compared to the water molecules. So, you can use if you add the alcohol that alcohol is going to make the interaction with the ligands present on the beads uh, 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 compared to the protein and that is going to displace the protein or by a detergent to displace the bound protein. You can use the detergent also because detergent is also hydrophobic in nature. So, if you supply the detergent, detergent is going to bind to the ligand and it is going to displace the protein. But the method number one which is actually decreasing the salt concentration is actually the mild method because that actually will not going to affect the proteins stability or proteins uh, activity. But uh, or activity, uh, but apart from that if you use the alcohol, the alcohol method is going to be very harsh and it may actually destroy the uh, activity as well as the uh, three dimensional uh, structure of the protein and the same is true for the detergent as well. But in some cases, sometimes what happen is that you have chosen a wrong matrix. For example, if you if you are uh, instead of using the phenyl saprose low substituted, suppose you have used the phenyl saprose high substituted and high substituted is going to have the higher affinity for the same protein. In those cases, what will happen is even if you flowing the uh, uh, salt uh, buffer without salt, which means you have decreased the salt, even then you are not bringing the hydration shell, you are not bringing the, uh, you are you are bringing the hydration shell back, but still it is not good enough to destroy the interaction between the ligand as well as the, uh, the patches or hydrophobic patches present on the protein. And in those cases, you might have to supply the non-polar solvent. So, people start with the alcohol and then they can go up to acetone and all those kind of benzene and hexane and all that. But as long as they go up to the alcohol, there is a possibility that the protein what they could elute probably will be active. But beyond that, if they supply the acetone or hexane, the, you, would, you would still be able to elute the protein from the beads but that eluted protein may not be active because most of the proteins structure are not stable enough to sustain such kind of harsh uh, hydrophobic uh, solvents because once you put the hydrophobic solvents, the, you are actually going to destroy the structure of the 
protein because the hydrophobic core which is present in the center of the protein will try to come out from the protein and because of in, in that process what will happen is the three dimensional arrangement of the protein is going to be completely altered. So, that is why it is advisable before you start an HIC application or HIC operation you should very briefly you test the affinity of a protein in a smaller volume so that uh, you will know that it, the protein is going to be eluted from the beads. Now, once your elution is over, you have to do a column regeneration because you have to reuse this column. So, after the elution of the analyte, the HIC column require a regeneration step to use it for the next time. The column is washed with 6 molar urea or gonadinium hydrochloride. This 6 molar urea or gonadinium hydrochloride is going to denature all the proteins and it is going to remove the non-specifically bound protein to the beads as well as it is going to remove all the proteins uh, which is bound to the ligand as well. So, that will remove all non-specifically bound protein. The column is then equilibrated with a mobile phase to regenerate uh, the column. The column can be stored at 4 degree in the presence of 20 percent alcohol containing the sodium azide. So, while you are not using any of the columns even if it is a ion exchange column or HIC column or gel filtration column or any other column, uh, you have to prefer you should ensure that you should store this column in a 20 percent alcohol containing the 0.2 percent azide. The, so, alcohol and azide combination is going to protect these uh, column material from getting the bacterial infection or getting the degradation because most of these columns are made up of, of the uh, sephiros or the agarose beads. Agarose are nothing but the uh, sugar molecules. So, it is sugar molecules. Uh, so, if you have a sugar sub solution, the bacteria is going to love to eat these sugar molecules. So, that is why you have to have the uh, preserved these beads in alcohol. So, 20 percent alcohol is going to be bactericidal and in addition you can also add the small amount of azide. So, the combination of alcohol and azide is going to protect your column from getting the bacterial contamination or bacterial growth. So, uh, so, this is all about the two chromatography techniques, the ion exchange chromatography techniques and the hydrophobic interaction chromatography technique uh, which we have discussed. Both of these uh, chromatography techniques are utilizing the charge group or the hydrophobic patches present on the protein surface and now in the su our subsequent lecture, we are going to talk about the chromatography which is going to work on the principle of the uh, surface area or the surf, uh, uh, the molecular size of the protein. So, with this I would like to con conclude our lecture here and in the next lecture we are going to discuss about the gel filtration chromatography. Thank you.